Today's date is November 15, 2011. I am Corey Beckford and I am not related to the interviewee. This interview is being conducted for the World War II Veterans History Project sponsored by the Historical Society of Palm Beach County and Oxbridge Academy of the Palm Beaches. This oral history will be sent for a conclusion in the Veterans History Project at the Liberty of Congress. Library. Library of Congress. <laughs> Uh, uh, would you please state your name? Murray Stein. Would you please spell your name? Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, Stein, S-T-E-I-N. What is your birthday? 9-23-25. What war did you serve in? World War II. What branch of service did you serve in? I was in the infantry. What was the highest rank you achieved? Corporal. Where were you born? Brooklyn, New York. Please tell us a little bit about your family. My family. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I uh, ended up, uh, I was the postmaster of uh, Brooklyn, New York until I retired in 1981. I retired 30 years ago at the age of 55, almost 56. Uh, I have two sons. Uh, I have a son, Mark, who's uh, 60. I have another son, Greg, who's uh, 57. Uh, my uh, younger son, Greg, has two daughters, uh, Lauren, who is 19, who will be attending Palm Beach State College, and uh, my, his other uh, daughter, one of my granddaughters, uh, Sabrina, who's six years old. And the, the reason is there were two mothers. Uh, my son's first wife uh, was killed in an automobile accident, and uh, that was the, the mother of the older granddaughter, Lauren, and uh, he remarried and he has a, a daughter who is uh, six years old. She's a spectacularly a little girl. Uh, what did your parents do for a living? My parents? Yeah. My parents were uh, immigrants from Europe. Uh, my father came from Germany. My mother came from uh, Russia. My mother, uh, I don't think my mother ever worked. Uh, from the time she came here, she met uh, my father. They were very young, they got married. And uh, she stayed home and he opened a, uh, my father was in the uh, uh, manufacturing of raincoats, ladies' raincoats. And that's, that's what he did most of his, uh, his life working until he retired. And uh, that's about their story. Very little education for both of them. Of course, they were sent here at the time when things were not going that well in Europe. Not that it was a problem with the Holocaust as yet, but uh, even in uh, 1900, uh, the, young, the uh, parents, my, great, my grandparents, although I never met any of them, uh, would have sent their uh, children to America for a better life. Other than yourself, did any of your family family members serve in the war? My, uh, I have an older brother who uh, was uh, he was with the 44th Division. He was wounded severely, uh, but he made it home, and uh, he passed away in uh, 2006, and he fought with the 44th Infantry. What, uh, what were you doing before you joined the service? I went to school. I, uh, I graduated high school. Uh, the war had started. And uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to start college. And uh, before I was drafted, I was drafted when I returned 18. I graduated high school. I was about 16 and a half years old. And I went up to, to uh, an Air Force place uh, called uh, the Rome Air Depot in Rome, New York. And I worked up there uh, as a young man till I was 18 and uh, registered for the draft, of course, and I was drafted. And in 1943, in December of 43, I was called. And uh, I went to work. Uh, to a number of uh, camps for, for training and uh, ended up with the 106th Infantry Division in Camp Shelby, I'm sorry, for uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And from there we were sent overseas and uh, 
got caught in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I don't know if you were aware, are they still, are they aware of the Battle of the Bulge? Uh, it's unfortunate that my, my brand new outfit that I was in, we were subjected, we were put online on December the 1st. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge began on December the 16th. Uh, a force of uh, almost uh, 500,000 Germans were in the Battle of the Bulge, and we were right in front. And my company and my regiment uh, was wiped out in four days. Uh, we actually joined uh, the combat on December the 1st, did a lot of uh, uh, just uh, going out and trying to check the lines. In fact, for a while, between the 1st or 2nd of December and the 16th of December, we saw the Germans on maybe 200, 300 yards uh, across from us, and we'd wave in the morning. And we'd go out on, uh, on uh, tours to find out what was going on. We didn't see anything going on with them. They were checking on us, and we all thought we'd be going home for Christmas. Unfortunately, on December the 16th, the Germans uh, started their attack for the Battle of the Bulge, which became them. Uh, named as the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, we lasted four days. Uh, we were a lot of my 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 uh, my fellow soldiers were killed and uh, wounded and uh, captured. Uh, my complete company was uh, uh, those of us who survived were, were captured and became prisoners of war. Were you married before you joined the service? No. Nope. I was, uh, I was too young. I was uh, 18 years old, uh, although I had a girlfriend. And uh, I tell this story, but it's a little, it's a, you know, a story that if I ever come back here and you become seniors and I tell the story again, I'll tell you the story about me and my girlfriend. I tell this uh, to all the high schools and colleges now because once the, uh, the teachers, the, your, the uh, professors in school hear my story, it's a fun story. They make me tell it to uh, the other students. And maybe someday when I come back, I'll tell that story, if I survive. Do you remember where you were on December 7th, 1941? On December 7th, 1941, mm -hmm. I was watching a football game. Uh, I don't remember who played right now, but uh, it was a Sunday. And I was in uh, my house with my father and uh, my folks. And I recall uh, my father, I think we had company, my, my, my parents did. And uh, all I recall is that uh, uh, I was watching a football game, as I remember. That's about it. Did you, uh, did you participate in basic training? Uh, and where, where was your basic training? I was sent to uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and uh, I trained in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and uh, I, was, uh, I was in a program called ASTP. Uh, during World War II, uh, the government decided that uh, because so many of us young people were going to end up in the war, that we would fall short with being uh, educated were going to colleges, and so they started a program called the Army Specialized Training Program, and we took exams, and I passed, as m many of my guys did, and many of us were sent to colleges uh, while we were in the service. I was sent to the University of Chicago. Unfortunately, on my way to Chicago, uh, there was a problem going on in Europe, uh, we lost a lot of people, and uh, things were not doing going well, and so they canceled the program. Although some of my people from my 106th actually spent uh, six or more months in colleges around the country, of course the program was good. It was meant to make certain that when the war ended that we still had young people going to college and uh, become teachers and scientists and doctors and dentists and whatever. So the program, unfortunately, uh, was curtailed. And my 106th Infantry Division was made up of a lot of uh, these young men, like myself, who were ASTP. 
and uh, we ended up in the 106th and went overseas. Uh, with them. How did you adapt to the military lifestyle? I loved it. I, I enjoyed being a soldier. Uh, I was a young, tough kid. I had played uh, high school, uh, <coughs> excuse me, basketball and football. I played uh, volleyball in the service. I boxed in the service. Uh, I was told that if, uh, in, Shan in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, if you were willing to, uh, to box as part of the entertainment and uh, exercises, uh, and if you, if you boxed and you won, you got a three-day pass to New Orleans. And so I boxed. I did a uh, three-round bout with a guy just as amateurish as myself. I won the fight, and uh, I took my buddy, uh, Angelo Dettara, a young fellow from uh, New Jersey, and we ended up in, for three days in uh, New Orleans. Uh, I fought uh, a second time, and somebody had told the, uh, the lieutenant in charge of the, the boxing uh, program that they think that young guy, Murray Stein, and uh, his company might have some professional experience. So I got in with a man who was a professional, and uh, he beat me up pretty bad. And uh, I ended up, by the way, in the hospital for a day or so. Uh, he kept hitting me in the arms. Kept, where I, after a while, I couldn't pick up my arms. And uh, it was, I think they stopped the fight. I'm not sure, because I wouldn't go down. I was embarrassed. But uh, I found out at that point that I wasn't going to be a boxer. <laughs> uh, could you explain how you got from the U.S. to the theater of operations where you fought? Well, uh, when it came time to go, we were shipped to uh, New York. We were put on uh, ships. I was on the, uh, the Queen Elizabeth. The Queen Elizabeth uh, was turned into a, uh, uh, a troop ship. And, uh, and they normally, in these uh, cruise ships, they have a cabin where you'd have two people uh, sleeping in two beds. We slept 16 in a cabin. Of course, they lined them up. They squared the room with uh, four high and, uh, and beds. And I went over on the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I don't think I was uh, well. One day, of course, I got seasick on the first day because in going over during World War II on these ships, they had a zigzag. They had to go in and out because of the, uh, the submarines that were, that were sinking a lot of our ships as we went over. And so the zigzag uh, caused many of us uh, to be seasick. And I recall eating a sandwich just lying in my bunk, and uh, the English sold us sandwiches at the time for 50 cents. We bought a sandwich, <laughs> not, not having to go down to lunch. Anyway, that's how I got overseas. We, we went over on uh, troop ships. I went over on the Queen Elizabeth, which was a beautiful ship that had been uh, made into a uh, troop ship. Uh, could you mention again, where did you serve? Say that again? Where did you serve? Where did I serve? Yeah. Well, we, uh, we landed in England. We trained in England. Uh, while in England, uh, we were uh, brought up to the fact that we were going to be going into combat as soon as we went over. We uh, went over on, uh, on, these, uh, on these little ships going across the English Channel. They took us across into France. Uh, we walked through France. Uh, when we got to Belgium, uh, when we reached Belgium, we, we hadn't reached any uh, combat as yet. When we got to Belgium, they had this line that was being manned by the second division. And again, since everybody really thought this was already uh, November of 1944, and uh, everybody was certain that the war would be over uh, during by uh, by Christmas time, and so there was very everything went very very uh, easily. We were all in good spirits. And we replaced the second division on that line that I told you about before, where we were able to wave to the German soldiers on the other side. And unfortunately, that's where the Battle of the Bulge began, uh, was in Belgium. 
Uh, I was caught in a town called Saint Vith, uh, Belgium. Uh, and uh, if you go into uh, World War II history, especially about the Battle of the Bulge, Saint Vith plays a very uh, strategic part of what the Germans were trying to do in their breakthrough. They wanted to drive us back to the English Channel. Uh, we were able to hold them. And we, 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 their timetable was, uh, was being held off because of the fact that while we were un, uh, unequipped, really, with enough ammunition, etc., to hold them, we did hold them for four days. And because of it, we got a, uh, a citation. Uh, the, it's the bronze star that you'll see in my display of uh, certificates and medals that I was able to get. And uh, this was one of them that was awarded to us because of the fact that we held out for the four days that we did, even though we were out of ammunition and what have you. You were in the infantry. What did the infantry do? What did the infantry do? Well, the infantry fights on the, on the land. Uh, it's the... Uh, you have the Air Force, of course, the flyers. You have the sailors who were on the ships. And then there's the infantry. And the infantry, basically, the infantry and artillery, uh, we fight the war on the land. You know, uh, we, you may hear many stories. You read the, uh, the newspapers. Uh, some of the politicians will tell you how uh, they don't want to put uh, boots on the ground. Because when you put boots on the ground, you put in infantry people or artillery people, and uh, you're getting them killed. And uh, we, we hope. Uh, what, what did we do in the infantry? We fought uh, with uh, M1 rifles. That was the, uh, the, the rifle, the popular rifle at the time. We had carbines. I carried a carbine because I was a uh, uh, I was a squad leader of a uh, mortar squad, 60 millimeter mortars. Uh, it's a little tube so when they missile into the tube, you shoot it out to uh, knock down uh, any, maybe an uh, some, uh, uh, some group of Germans that were, had a machine gun going in placement, and we'd, send, we'd lob these uh, missiles over, hoping to knock them out. And basically, that's what I did. But, uh, the infantry is foot soldiers with rifles, uh, mortars, uh, as I just explained, and uh, uh, machine gunners. And that's basically what the infantry does. The infantry is uh, fights, fights in the mud and the cold and the snow. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge, they indicated, was the, close, was the uh, coldest winter uh, in history at that time. And we were fighting. There was, by the way, there was a million uh, soldiers, Americans and Germans, but not only Americans, but some uh, of our allies were involved in that, in the Battle of the Bulge. Actually, about 600,000 of Allied troops, including the Americans, against 500,000 Germans. It was a tremendous battle. It's the, probably the, uh, the most important battle of all uh, in the history of of warfare uh, in Europe. Of course, in Japan they had other problems. What specific unit were you assigned to? What was the... I just explained, I was a mortar man. I was, mortar. Uh, I carried a 60 millimeter, a 60 millimeter mortar, we had a squad. And, uh, and should, would you like a story about what, how, how we, uh, come, how we, uh, participated in combat. Uh, on the 16th of December, when the uh, Battle of the Bulge began, uh, my mortar squad, we set up uh, a mortar, and uh, the 60 millimeter mortar, and uh, we were in the, uh, uh, the Ardennes forest in Belgium. And the Ardennes had a lot of trees, and in order to make certain that we wouldn't send up a, uh, a missile that would hit the trees and come back on us. We would look out and make certain that the trajectory of uh, our 60 millimeter wouldn't hit a tree and go 
uh, uh, head out towards the enemy. Uh, on the 16th of December, we set up this gun, uh, Sergeant uh, Sammy Pate and myself, and uh, there was a sniper up there. We weren't aware of it at the time, and while we were setting up, uh, Sammy got killed. Sammy was shot. This was on the first day we were in combat. Uh, he got hit in the head, flipped over, and uh, a, a round exploded in front of us. I, got, uh, I was hit by shrapnel in my leg and my hand, and uh, our ammo bearer, and this is a story we've been telling for many, many years around. It's been in books as well. Uh, he got shot. Uh, Sparky Sanger, in fact, I just spoke to him the other day, and he flipped over. And I looked at Sammy Pate, my buddy who was just killed, and I went over to, I crawled over to uh, Sparky. I said, what happened? He said, I'm shot, I'm shot. And th there was a hole. You could see in his ear, but he wasn't bleeding or anything, and he had flipped over. And what has happened, the bullet went, you know, he was holding a, uh, one of the, the rounds of the uh, 60s. The bullet went through his sleeve, went into his pocket, and we used to carry our spoons from our mess kit. And the spoon is very big. It's uh, like a very large soup spoon that you would see today. And the bullet lodged in the spoon, and the spoon closed up on the bullet. So while it knocked him over, uh, of course, he survived, and this spoon has become very famous. We, uh, he has never gone into a, hop, a hospital for an operation or whatever because he had to go into a couple. Uh, that spoon always went with him, and at all the reunions that we have, by the way, we just completed our 65th reunion in Baltimore, Maryland this past September. We started the uh, reunions in uh, 1947. And uh, I'm the adjutant of the uh, former president and the adjutant of the 106th Infantry Division. And uh, Sparky Sanger, Harold Sanger is his real name, he, he ended up a, a professor in a little college in Illinois, and he comes with that spoon wherever we go. Uh, so that's, that's what we did. Uh, we lost a lot of our people who were, uh, were killed, wounded, and. Uh, a lot of us were taken uh, the prisoners of war. Uh, could, you, could you explain more about your time as a prisoner of, prisoner of war? Well, uh, I was a prisoner for almost six months. Uh, I played football in uh, school. At the time, I weighed about 210 pounds. Uh, I was a, a defensive well, When we played, you, you played both sides. You know? Uh, I was on the line, I was a tackle, and uh, I was in pretty good shape. I weighed 126 pounds when I got out, uh, when I was liberated. I, uh, I, was put, I was sent to a work camp. I was sent to a place called Stalag 4B. Stalag 4B was a, um, uh, a prison camp where they had uh, Americans, German, uh, Americans, uh, Frenchmen, Canadians, uh, English, and Russian prisoners. Uh, the the uh, Russian prisoner of war was treated very bad. We were not treated well at all, but they weren't given anything. They were, uh, they were really, uh, the Germans and the Russians really hated each other. I don't think the, uh, we were hated as much because basically we weren't their enemy until we got into the war ourselves. And, uh, my time in uh, the prison camp was, uh, I was sent to, uh, after a couple of, maybe a month or so, uh, working in uh, Stalag 4B, I was pulled out with a group and we were sent to uh, another camp in uh, Elster on the Elm River. It was called the Elster of an Elf was the name. And I was in a work camp there. Uh, and. Uh, I developed, while I was there, I developed a hernia. Well, what we were doing, we were uh, moving railroad ties. A lot of groups of us trying to move ties. I, I developed a hernia, hernia and uh, the Germans sent me to a hospital 
in uh, Halle, Germany, H-A-L-L-E. Halle, Germany is where I ended up. This was about, uh, after about four months, I ended up in a hospital there and I was uh, liberated uh, by uh, the American 104th Infantry Division. And uh, it's a good story in that the 104th, uh, my buddy, uh, I lived in a four-family house in uh, Brooklyn, New York when I was going to school and uh, my buddy, Jerry Dworkin, uh, he lived downstairs, I lived upstairs in his house, and we played football together at uh, New York High School in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and Jerry's outfit liberated uh, my, my, my uh, prison camp. I never saw him, though. He was on leave uh, at the time, and so it, it really would have been great had I seen him himself. But uh, his uh, outfit uh, liberated my, uh, my camp. Were you there when the Soviet Army, when the Soviet Army liberated the camp? No, I was not there. Uh, as I say, I was when I was moved to uh, Elster on the Elbe River. Uh, we were right across from the Russians, but we never really, uh, we never really met up with them. And uh, from Elster, I was sent to this hospital where I was liberated. You mentioned that the. Russians were treated badly, worse than you were. Do you remember how, how bad they were treated? They got no food. They, they, we were getting very little food. Uh, working in Stalag 4B, you know, if you spent uh, the day maybe putting in uh, 10 to 12 hours, uh, and what they gave us, once a day we got a slice of black bread and a little bowl of what they called soup. That was it. And I don't, from what we saw from the Russians, uh, we had very little contact with them, but from what we saw, uh, it looked like they were getting nothing. And uh, the, uh, I, I think they still hate each other, okay. the Germans and the Russians. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, what was your perception of the Soviets at the time? My perception of the Soviet. They were our allies at the time, and of course, one of the things that was being said to us by the German prison, uh, the, uh, the German guard, uh, was that one day you'll be coming back here to fight the, uh, the Russian. And uh, that's been a, uh, it's a popular story that went on during World War II, that uh, when we get done with the Germans, unfortunately, we we'll probably have to, have to get ready to fight the Russians. Uh, my own uh, perception is uh, uh, I have nothing against them. My mother was uh, from Russia. Uh, I, uh, I was always fearful that uh, eventually we might get into a, a confrontation. And uh, of course, then with, uh, after the atomic bomb, uh, when I got out of the service, I, I was always concerned that uh, our government would not get involved uh, not only with the Russians, but with anyone else, because of the, uh, the possibility of atomic warfare. Now, I know that you received a Purple Heart. Was that from the boxing injury, or...? Oh, no. no. <laughs> you don't get Purple Hearts from boxing industry. I was, uh, I had shrapnel hit my knee and one on my finger. And uh, that's uh, how I got my, my uh, Purple Heart. It was a good wound because uh, it didn't kill me. And uh, while I was uh, incapacitated for a while, uh, uh, I was able to earn the, uh, the Purple Heart. But more important uh, is the fact that uh, I was a combat infantry soldier, and uh, I was very proud of that. And uh, I was proud of the men I served with. And even now, uh, when we just met in, uh, in Baltimore, when we sit and talk, and uh, I sat with one of my buddies, and uh, he looked at me and he said, is it possible that uh, 60 some odd years ago, we were in that foxhole, you know, worried about are we gonna make it? And here we are, all these years later, sitting in this restaurant at this beautiful hotel in Baltimore. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, my group is, uh, I am. Uh, I'm married to a lovely 
young lady that I, I, I tell this story about when I go around, but uh, we just celebrated October the 19th, our 65th wedding anniversary. And uh, young people like yourself, where I've gone, they finally look at me and they go, how old are you? <laughs> and I'm 86 years old. So, but I'm very lucky. I'm still here. The woman you are currently married to, is she the same girl back in high school? or? That's a, that's a good story. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Yeah. 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 You've teased it twice now. <laughs> There's always a young girl, pretty, just like you, sitting in the room. And what I do is I, I, I look at her and I tell her, there's a guy in the back, and this always happens. There's a fellow in the back who's got his eye on you. And you've got to be very careful. And let me tell you why. A lot of years ago, I got to high school, and I saw this gorgeous young girl. And I walked over to her and I said, I'd like to be your friend. And she said, will you please leave me alone? And so a couple of days later, I tried it again. I said, I, I, all I want to be is your friend, you know? And she said, will you stop bothering me? She said, yeah, I'm going to have to tell the teacher. I said, what are you going to tell her? Well, I want her to come as your friend. This went on for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Finally, I walked over and I said, why don't you want to be my friend? She said, okay, we'll be friends, you know? And so we started talking and uh, every so often, we met each other, we said hello, uh, we took a walk together, and then one day I said, I'd like to be your boyfriend. <laughs> she said, now listen, you know, <laughs> I don't mind being your friend and what have you, and we went on and on like that. And uh, I graduated, she was still in school, and uh, we, we kept seeing each other, our good friends. Uh, when I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, we used to hang out in the street with fellas and gals who lived in the area. There was no problem. We never had the problems you youngsters have today. At any rate, I got drafted, and uh, I said to this young girl, Barbara, uh, would you wait for me? She said, well, we'll, we'll have to see. And I left. And uh, I wrote her a couple of letters, and uh, Finally, uh, when I got home, uh, I looked her up and I said, Barbara, uh, I'd like to go out. We started going out, and uh, it wasn't long that uh, we found that we, we loved each other and we got married. And my story is, when I tell it to the young people like yourself about that guy who's been watching you, that be very careful if he wants to be your friend because it could be for life. That's the story. Uh, can you tell us some more about your friendships that you made in the service? Well, uh, as I told you, I'm the, I was the president of the 106th Infantry Association, and I am the adjutant now. Uh, what an adjutant does is uh, I uh, help, uh, I run all the reunions, and I help maintain the, uh, the bylaws and uh, the contact uh, between uh, all our people to the extent with the, uh, the treasurer and what have, just so that we keep going, whatever problems come up, uh, I can sort of help out. And uh, I have become, I have some uh, friends in the, uh, from the 106th that I still am involved with. Uh, this fellow I told you about, uh, Sparky Sanger, Harold Sanger and I uh, were closer than uh, I would have ever been with my own brother. Uh, we love each other. Uh, we talk all the time. He's in Illinois and I'm here, so we don't see each other except at reunions. Uh, but I have a number of uh, people. Uh, unfortunately, some of the, my best friends uh, have passed, uh, are gone. But I'm also uh, we meet uh, a group of us, sex POWs, we meet the first Monday of every month. We have been for more than 20 years now at the VA in West Palm Beach. And we're a family. Uh, these are all ex POWs from all the wars. Uh, we had normally, we used to have about 50, 60 of us 
uh, who met with their wives, whatever, uh, we're down to uh, maybe, uh, we meet maybe 15 or 20 of us, so, but we're still, uh, we call each other. If uh, anybody has a problem health-wise, we'll visit, uh, we'll contact uh, help for them if they need it. And uh, as a service officer, I was able to do that for a while until I got hurt. So uh, that, that type of friendship that, uh, that began in a foxhole in Germany, or in Belgium in this case, with the 106th Infantry, uh, is a friendship you can't, uh, uh, it lasts forever, you know. It's, uh, it's something that uh, it's just, you've, we, we shared the same foxhole. And there's uh, many stories that uh, you'll find as you grow older. You'll, you'll read some of the stories of uh, the, uh, the kinship that develops because of uh, the time that you spend together and uh, having served in a war together, uh, sat in a foxhole with a guy. You know, and that's uh, at binding. You can't help that. And you know, while we're talking, I, I asked if I could read to you something. Uh, I didn't write this, but it was written by a, uh, a prisoner of war, and it's called the, the POW Pledge of Allegiance. So, uh, if I might. I pledge allegiance to the flag. I am an American. I was a POW. I have served my country. I need no one to tell me what allegiance I owe to my flag, to my home, of the United States of America. This is my country. I have fought for it. I have been imprisoned for it. I have died for it. And to the republic for which it stands, this flag stands for me, for love, my love for my family, my love for my friends. I did not forsake it when I was beaten when I was starved, when I was killed. One nation under God, indivisible. I am one man. I have one country. I worship one God. Under God I was saved. Under God I have no fear. With liberty and justice for all. My allegiance is to liberty, to justice. My flag represents the best of myself, my effort, my home, my country. I will pledge allegiance to the flag. I will pledge under the love of God. It is my right, my privilege, my duty. I have earned it. Tell me not how. I have given you much. I am an ex-POW. Take nothing more from me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. This was written by somebody. I wish we could find out who he is, but we're, we were able to do that. Well, on that note, uh, there were underground newspapers printed by the prisoners. Do you recall seeing them? Not really. An underground newspaper? Uh, yeah. Not in my prison camp, but uh, I, I was telling uh, Tony and your, your teacher here about some of the people that go with me on the speaking tours. Um, one of our pilots, uh, Ed Horn, Major Horn was a uh, pilot on a B-24. He was shot down uh, over Europe. And he ended up in the camp. You're not old enough, but the, your teachers are. Uh, there was a picture called The Great Escape. Uh, he served in that camp, and uh, he has a slide projection that he brings with us, and we show the young people what the English did at that time to develop that underground tunnel to get out uh, of that uh, prison camp. And uh, he was there, so of course, uh, when he explains it, uh, it's, it's accurate. It's as accurate as it possibly can be, and the slides are great. Uh, uh, someday, when they become seniors, if we're still alive, you have us come here, we'll do that whole program. It's a deal, right?
Did you ever get the chance to meet General S. Patton? George. Oh, George no. S. Patton. No, I didn't. Uh, blood and guts. He was, uh, he was marvelous. It's just a shame that he was killed. Uh, he never really got to see the end, you know. He was killed as a, a young man, but he was a tough, uh, marvelous general. Uh, he was uh, he was in charge of the tanks. In fact, when we were uh, because the Battle of the Bulge when it began, uh, the weather was so bad that we couldn't get planes flying in to get us supplies and ammunition, etc. And we were waiting for Patton's tanks to come up and maybe help us, you know, so that we could escape what was happening. Uh, but the weather was so bad that uh, it took them. Uh, more time than it took for us, but eventually they got there, and of course the Battle of the Bulge ended sometime around March of 1945 when uh, the Germans uh, realized, I think, uh, they weren't going to win the war. Well, how did you communicate with your friends and family back in the U.S.? Well, uh, we sent, uh, we were able to write uh, I forget, I think it was called V-Mail. And uh, we were able to do that while I was in England. But once we got into combat, there was no way we could uh, uh, communicate with our families. But uh, I have to tell you that my father and mother found out uh, that I was a prisoner of war. Uh, and uh, they were, I'm sorry, uh, they found out that I was missing in action. They were notified by the War Department that I was missing in action as all of us were. Uh, they had no idea uh, whether or not I was I had survived or not on the way home. I came home on a uh, Liberty ship and uh, I think it was June or July, maybe June of 1945. And when we reached the dock in New York, there was a man standing at the dock waving at us and he said, is there anybody who would like me to make a call for him to let somebody in the family know that he's here in New York. And we all looked at each other, you know, and a couple of called out, and I yelled out, uh, okay, I'll give you a number, and I gave him my sister's number. And all I know is that he did call her, I found out afterward, and was the first she knew that not only was I alive, but I was on a ship in New York. And she called my parents, and uh, my father was a very stately looking man, very tall, and he turned white. And uh, from the time that his, one of his sons was messing in action, the other one was wounded in a hospital in England. And so it, it's, it's interesting that this gentleman, whoever he was, he made a number of calls, including the one to my sister, and my, that's how my family found out. Uh, that I not only was alive, but I was in uh, on, on a ship in New York Harbor. When you were off duty, what did you do? Well, uh, we were off duty in uh, in America. When we were off duty, we uh, there was always a a town nearby, a city, Camp Shelby, was near Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, Camp Atterbury was Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, and uh, we went and we had a lot of fun. Uh, the Sammy Pate that I told you was killed the first day in action. Sammy Pate was the strongest young man I had ever met in my life. He, uh, he gave us the physical training uh, for the, uh, the company. Uh, he could do one-arm push-ups all day if he had to. He would go on and on. You'd have to just tell him to stop. That's how strong he was. And so Sammy and I, his real name was Marvin C. Pate from Houston, Texas. We called him Sammy for some reason, I don't know why even today, but we became uh, attached to each other and uh, we were called uh, the Mutton Jeff. He was about five foot five, I was six foot four. And uh, we'd go into a place called Steins in Indianapolis. No. I, they weren't involved with family, no relation, although my name is Stein. But there, it was a pub. It was a, uh, a bar and grill in Indianapolis. And uh, Sammy Pate was the kind of guy, if he saw a pretty little girl, 
uh, he'd walk over and he'd ask her to dance, you know, even though she would be sitting with somebody. So many times we had to stand back to back. But that's what we did. We went out and we, we, we'd have a beer. You know. And uh, it was uh, a different time of our life, you know. I was never a real drinker, still not. I'll, I'll drink something, you know, with, uh, for company, have a glass of wine. But in those days, uh, at the age of 18, 19, and 20, you know, looking for girls. How was the adjustment back to normal life? I was happy to get home. Uh, a lot of my friends uh, were, had come home who were served. You know, World War II was not, was not what the world, the, the wars that we're involved in today in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, there's maybe one, a total of one million uh, soldiers and sailors who are involved at this time and no more than maybe a, a hundred thousand here and a hundred thousand there but World War II 16 million of us 16 million of us were involved and so you not only went you wanted to go because you'd be embarrassed uh, to be home you didn't want to be called one of those four F's uh, who was not able to go and fight for his country it was different. Everybody was involved in World War II, every family. There wasn't a, a family on the block that uh, wasn't involved with somebody who was in the service or uh, was involved with somebody uh, from their families, from, from wherever they came from. Uh, today, of course, it's unfortunate, uh, if I may be a little political here, it's unfortunate that the only ones fighting are the fellows who sign up and you have this small group of soldiers and you can go from house to house and unfortunately very few people are even aware but, you know have nobody who who's in the service don't know anybody who's in the service and that was not world war ii world war ii we were all in it together today it's unfortunate these young people are out there fighting uh, and there's not enough of us uh, supporting them Next. Oh. I really didn't want to get into that, but... Uh, Where were you when you heard uh, Germany surrender? Where was I? Uh, I was home. I was already home. I was uh, on this hospital ship that brought me home, and uh, I was happy about that, but I was worried that my buddies who were on leave with me from Europe were told they might have to go to the Pacific now, but uh, things turned out well and the war ended in, in the Pacific as well, and so uh, we, we couldn't have gone. If you were a prisoner of war in Germany, even though we were home and the war was still on, they couldn't send us to uh, Japan. It was uh, an edict that was issued by the government that no, uh, no ex-POW from uh, Europe would be sent on to, uh, to fight in the Pacific. So, when did you first hear about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? When I was home. <laughs> uh, hard to believe that uh, the Americans were the first to have to use the atomic bomb. But uh, in looking at history and understanding what was going on, uh, it obviously saved uh, many of uh, American lives. Because had, we had to invade Japan, we would have lost, uh, they estimate, uh, a million of our troops might have been killed uh, had we had to uh, uh, go into Japan. So while it was a horror that we did use it, uh, it obviously saved a lot of our lives. Uh, and of course, uh, I hope, I'm sure you all do, everybody, that we never have to witness an atomic bomb explosion again. One of the things I tell all my uh, all people when we go around, by the way, is we start off by telling you that war is hell. That uh, anybody who wants to uh, have, you want to go to war, uh, is, is sick. And what uh, we end up by telling all our high school graduates, that uh, we hope that someday 
uh, you use your education, go on to college. When you get your education, that if you're ever in a position of authority, that instead of uh, ending arguments uh, by violence or fighting about it, but settling all the you know, your disputes across the table. And uh, that's one of the messages uh, we leave in all the schools we go to, that uh, war is something that nobody should have to get involved in. And it, unfortunately, the world is always at war. Do you recall where you were when FDR died? And if so, what was your reaction to that? I really don't, because I think I was, uh, I was in prison camp at the time he died. And I don't remember when we found out. What life lessons did you get from being in the military? What, what? What life lessons did you get from being in the military? Well, I think I am a, the better man, person, uh, for having served. My uh, experience as a prisoner of war uh, taught me a number of things. Uh, while we understand uh, uh, men can be uh, cruel to each other. Uh, I was a, a prisoner in a German camp where we had one of our guards uh, who was a, a human being. He, uh, when I was, uh, when they found out I needed uh, help because of a hernia, he took me to a store where they got me a, uh, a truss. A truss, you wear, for somebody who uh, has a hernia, it's a belt that you wear in the groin area so to avoid the swelling. And uh, he was a beautiful human being. In fact, when he took me, he knew how hungry I was. Uh, he had a sandwich, he gave me half the sandwich. So what I was able to learn that uh, even in the middle of all this horror, of combat, uh, there were human beings out there uh, on both sides, on all sides, and uh, did it for myself. Uh, I think that uh, my attitude with people, my attitude with uh, my family, my wife, my friends, and my community. I've been active in my community uh, for many years. Um, I'm active at the VA, working with people. And uh, I think that my service uh, sort of helped develop me as a, a better human being than I would have been. Uh, and I think my experience as a prisoner of war uh, really gave me the, uh, of the value of life and the value of being good to each other, being nice to each other. What was the funniest thing to happen to you during your time in the military? Funniest thing? Yeah. I really don't know if there was anything funnier. There was some times we had a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I think when uh, when I went to New Orleans for uh, that three-day pass when I boxed, I'm sure I had a great <laughs> time. But uh, funny, uh, it was different. I don't know. There were there was some very uh, some very interesting times where we enjoyed each other, enjoyed life, uh, being a soldier. Uh, when uh, even in England, we we got to uh, to visit. Uh, I was in a uh, called the Cheltenham Racetrack is where we were trained. And when we got off, we had some. You know, we went out uh, to get a beer, uh, uh, whatever. You know, and. Uh, I don't know of any one incident that was funny. Uh, pleasant, yes. Fun. I, I had good times with my uh, my fellow soldiers and what have you. Yes, Men, uh, many many times we enjoy each other. Would you say the arm was the funniest moment with the boxing? But that wasn't funny. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, he hurt me. He was uh, he was professional. He knew what the, what he was doing, and he kept hitting me in the arms, knowing that. Uh, knowing what he knows about the boxing, uh, I guess I was, you know, I was, uh, I don't know if I was 19 yet, I was a pretty strong kid. And uh, he could have hit me all day, 
but uh, eventually he would have knocked me down if it went on and on. But I guess he didn't want me to hit him. So he made sure my, my arms were not going to be utilized anyway. Uh, but that wasn't funny. That was, uh, that was tragic. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, other than uh, uh, I'm glad uh, I've had this opportunity to meet you people. I'd like to meet you again, God willing, for me. Uh, when you become seniors, so I could bring my other my people with me, and you would enjoy uh, some of the other stories uh, of people who flew in the airplanes, and uh, my buddy a piece of alive, who was at Tuskegee Airman. Mean, you love this guy; he's funny, and he tells a story about how uh, the black uh, soldier or the black young man growing up, uh, what they had to endure. And uh, what he became, he, uh, he retired as a colonel, and uh, he's a marvelous uh, young man. I keep saying young, a marvelous human being, and uh, he's marvelous for the. Whenever we go into the minority group areas, and we do some of these high schools where, and uh, well, not not the colleges, but in the high schools, we have somewhere there uh, predominant. Uh, at least 50% or more are minority young people and he goes over great because he really lays it on and he tells the story about uh, what you can achieve, what you, you can be anything you want to be and of course you, you look at him and he's a good looking guy by the way too uh -huh. and they all wear red, they come in a red jacket. Anybody who fought as a Tuskegee Airman that's what they, they wear these red suit coats, you know, a regular sport coat, but it's got to be red. And that's, uh, that's what they wore when they, when they fought, they always wore something red. And uh, he wears this beautiful sport coat with all the ribbons on it and what have you. That's about it for Tony, us. Tony, I know you've got a couple <coughs> questions. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. When you were captured, um, I'm sure they, they searched you. Was there any items you were allowed to keep for they take everything away from you other than your uniform and maybe your steel pot? No, what, uh, in, my own, in my case, uh, I had a ring that was given to me by a friend and it wouldn't come off. And uh, one of the soldiers wanted to, wanted to get it off, you know, any which way. But one of the, uh, the other men, one of the uh, infantrymen, the German infantrymen, told him, you know, don't, don't. And uh, so he walked away from me. They, they didn't take anything uh, from me except when we got on the boxcars. I wanted to show these young people what a boxcar looks like. Of course, I'm sure they're going to hear it. This is a, a boxcar that we were used for transporting prisoners of war from the from the uh, the battlefield to the uh, to the uh, prison camps. They were called forty and eights. They had either forty men or eight horses, and we would be packed into these uh, into these boxcars when we were uh, sent as prisoners to the uh, Stalags and. Uh, what they did with me, they took my combat boots. And so the march from uh, the, from the, uh, the Belgian Ardennes forest to the, uh, to, to the boxcar, I was in my stocking feet. They took, uh, we had great uh, combat boots that went up, you know, where they flapped and what have you. And uh, they were, they, they took mine. And uh, that was one of the problems I have with my feet today because of uh, the fact that we had to walk that way. But at any rate, uh, other than that, no, I was not. I was never searched. I was never interrogated. Now, many people will tell you stories about their being interrogated, and we were not. My group was not for some reason. I guess they knew enough about us, they did not test us anything. Murray, you told the story um, earlier, uh, before we started taping, about. Um Prisoners of War being taken to the mine in Berg. Would you share that? This is fascinating. And um, we're going to be studying the Holocaust next term and uh, at length. And 
this is one of those stories I think they'd like to hear. Well, I, many of our prisoners, our American prisoners, were sent to a camp called Stalag 9B. Stalag 9B, uh, they took every Jewish uh, American prisoner and they segregated them into a, uh, one of the barracks. And uh, after a couple of weeks, they were told they were going to be transferred to a, another camp. But what it really was, was the Germans were building a, uh, in a mine, they were building some sort of a factory that they needed help from this mine, whatever they were taking out, I'm not certain, he would know. But uh, what happened was they needed 350 uh, soldiers to go to work in these mines, which was illegal. Uh, they weren't, you weren't supposed to work in that type of uh, atmosphere. But they took all the Jewish prisoners, and there were 175 of them, and they needed 350, so they took 175 more from uh, Stalag 9B and sent them to this work camp called Berger, B-E-R-G-A, Berger, Germany. And in Berger they had these mines, they were all sent to when they were working alongside of uh, uh, Holocaust uh, the victims. And uh, this Berger was actually a, uh, attached to the, I think it was the, uh, uh, one of the uh, the concentration camps. I forget which one it was, uh, but it was one of the. It was attached to one of them, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the work was such that uh, of the 350 that were sent, and then when the Russians started to come and they were going to attack, they pulled them out and uh, put them on a forced march, and uh, actually of the 350, approximately, uh, we were told somewhere. I might be off on this, but it was somewhere between 75 and 100 survived. The rest all would die, and some were actually killed uh, on the forced march. It's a, it's a terrible story, but it's uh, one that had to be told, and there was a, uh, a film made of this, and which is, uh, has been shown on uh, uh, HBO a number of times. It's called Burger. In the POW camp at Stalag 4B, was there a command structure within the, 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 the US, uh, US POWs and then within the overall Allied soldiers that were POWs? And, uh, I'm, I'm in Stalag 4B was very big. It was, uh, there was a lot of us, you know, uh, of, all, uh, of all nations. And so we didn't get involved in, in that case. However, when I got to uh, Elster on the Elbe River, that camp, where we were, there was about a hundred of us, we did have a, uh, if you wanted to get out, if you wanted to try and escape, uh, we had one person, you had to check it with him, and uh, he would help you get a chocolate bar or something that, uh, to help you go. Uh, that's one of the, my stories uh, for myself is that in order to help do this, uh, a friend of mine, one of my uh, ex-prisoners, uh, we, in order to get, to be able to get out, we dug a hole under one side of the, uh, of the wiring, and in fact one night, uh, I went out, but the boys, what we did, they, we took a pair of pants, tied the, the bottom of the, uh, of your pants, of the leg, and uh, right across from us, that we could see across the road, was a, uh, a mound of what they called the kartoffels that were put there for the winter. Kartoffel is German for potato. Mm. And uh, they used to have these mounds of kartoffels that they put there for the winter, and they would stay until uh, the winter would end, you know, the thaw would come and they would be able to get these potatoes. And uh, that mound had us, was driving us up a wall. And one day, uh, one night, uh, I did get out. Uh, it was a very tough night. I never, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a brave guy. 
uh, I, waiting for the guards to go by on the road to make certain that I would go over. At any rate, I filled up those potatoes in the pants, tied them up, brought them back, and we had a pot belly stove right in the middle of the, uh, our barrack. And what we did, we took the potato and whatever somebody had, something that might slice the potato, we'd slice it and slap it on the, the pot belly stove and then it became like a french fried potato. And uh, we did that for one night until uh, they found out about it and uh, we, we lost that sack. We had it hidden under, under the floor, but uh, they found it. And, but for one night, we were slicing it and putting them on the uh, stove. There's a lot of stories, but... Uh, but the, um, the barracks uh, that you stayed in at either of the camps, to, did, um, how many men did it hold and what was that like? Well, in Starlock 4B, it was a tremendous... Uh, uh, you know, the barracks were big. Uh, there was a load over them. I think I showed you, I had that picture of what, what the camp looked like. And so, this is just the follow up for me. You see how many buildings they have. But anyway, in one of in the building that I was in, where I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, we slept. Two in a, we had like a, a bottom lunk, a bunk and a top bunk, and we had straw mattresses. It was very uncomfortable, but it was where we slept. And uh, basically, uh, the problem in the, all these camps was the lack of food. But of course, the Germans were in trouble with food already at that point because this was December of 1944, and. Uh, you know, it was, it was drawing to a close with that they were having trouble feeding their own people. And certainly they weren't going to give us. And when the Red Cross parcels came, unfortunately, they kept them. Uh, I, the, the one Red Cross parcel I got was when I got to the hospital about a week or two before I was liberated. And I shared that with about 18 fellas. So. Um, it stopped for me in a barracks building. Did they house a combination of all Allied soldiers, or was it no, U.S. soldiers? No, what I was in was all American. All American? Yeah. The English, the English were there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. The English uh, had the place uh, organized. I think if we had stayed any longer, I would have run into what you're asking. Was there some sort of a command or mm -hmm. what have you? Uh, I'm sure there was with the English. And the, uh, the English uh, were very good. The English and the Canadians, if they had anything to share, they would, they would have uh, shared it with you. I mean, there wasn't much, but whatever it was, if they gave you a piece of bread, it was it would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, we got that from the English, we got that from the uh, Canadians. Unfortunately, from the French, they were like, uh, the French were honored prisoners. They had the, uh, they could get out, they could walk outside, they could walk around the ground. Uh, I don't know why. But there was some sort of a, a, a relationship that drove us up a wall. But uh, that was part of their uh, whatever they did. This was at Stalag 4B. Beyond that, I have no idea, you know, uh, other than when we got to Elster, where it was only American. Anybody else any questions? None whatsoever. I'll, I'll let me grab. Go ahead, Greg. You said when you heard about Pearl Harbor you were watching a football game. Were you watching it or listening to it on the radio? Was I what? Were you watching it on the television or wa listening to it? I think it was on the radio. I'm not sure yeah. now. I'm pretty sure. It must have been on the radio because I, I lived with uh, my mom and dad in this uh, home. I don't think we had television at that time. I wasn't sure it was the radio. You're the second person to say they were in New York listening to a football game. It was the New York Giants game that day is what the other I'm person sure said. I'm sure it was the yeah. Giants. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Giant fan today. <laughs> when you came back home, what job did you do? 
Well, when I came back, I was uh, uh, I wanted to go to college, go back to college, and uh, wanted to play basketball. Uh, I tried out uh, for LIU. I went to LIU for a while, of Long Island University in New York, and I tried out for the basketball team with the coach uh, Claire B, who was very very famous at that time, still famous. He was a marvelous coach. Uh, now he he offered me to stay at the school. Uh, for my education, uh, because I could go on to the GI Bill, so I, uh, I didn't need him to get into school, but uh, I wasn't able to make the team. Uh, I guess I wasn't fast enough. I couldn't. I'm a white guy who can't jump that high. <laughs> but uh, uh, I was a tough kid. I played uh, tough basketball, but anyway, I didn't make it. And unfortunately, uh, I was 20 years old. And at the age of 20, I had already been in the Army. I was wounded. I was a prisoner of war. I came home looking to, for a life, and I was still only 20 years old. And I had already done this. And uh, the thought of going to, back to school uh, was not easy for me. And I don't know what I wanted to do. So I took a job in the evening in the post office, just so that I would uh, I'd get involved there and then I'd go to school. And uh, I was enjoying it, and uh, time went on, and uh, I was there when they gave the first examination for a supervisor. At any rate, uh, I became, I got fortunate. I became a supervisor, and then Somebody in the Postal Service in Washington, uh, I met him at some meeting, I don't remember where, they decided to send me and a group of us to the University of Virginia. And I was sent to the University of Virginia, uh, their graduate school, for a summer. And I, I got an education at, uh, uh, at the graduate school of the University of Virginia, which uh, has stayed with me till today. I was fortunate. I walked on the ground of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the professors, they were marvelous. And uh, uh, I took over. When I was there, the, uh, because of my, uh, at my going there and getting trained there, I came back. Uh, I was called to Washington, and they asked me, uh, I was interviewed, and they made me the, the, the postmaster manager of uh, Brooklyn and Staten Island in New York. And uh, I was very fortunate, and because of that, I, uh, that was my, uh, my, my career, uh, other than my becoming a volunteer. I have volunteered uh, for many years, I would say for the past uh, maybe 40, 50 years, I have been a volunteer in some sort. I uh, worked in, the, I was a volunteer in the hospitals in uh, Florida. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a candy man in the hospice. Hospice is an area where uh, some of our patients are uh, there for their last days. And I became the candy man. I bring them newspapers and I was candy and uh, I'd sell little uh, stuffed animals. And uh, from that, I went from that to volunteering in, uh, in schools. Uh, I, be, I, I was involved in a program called Listening to Children. And I worked with children in the, uh, from say second to fourth grade, uh, children who were having problems at home and uh, who would sit and talk with me and uh, I'd meet with them uh, maybe twice a week. I did that for a while. I brought them little candy and we talked, they would play games, and I, I hoped that I was able to uh, do something for them uh, as well. And, uh, and then I became involved with, I felt, uh, I want to be involved with the veteran. And so I, I got involved at, uh, in West Palm Beach. And uh, I, I've been very lucky. I've been very fortunate. Uh, and I, if I can give you a message about that, is when you do get old enough, 
uh, it's very important to spend some of your time volunteering, uh, doing something for somebody else other than for yourself. And uh, you get so much out of it. Uh, there's no question that I have become a better human being because uh, of my lifestyle. I've been very lucky. I have one last question. From your experiences as a POW, how did the Germans treat U.S. soldiers that were captured that were Jewish? Well, I just told you about Berger. Right, but from your experiences, did my, you see any of that? Uh, I, I had no problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I was a pretty tough kid. They, uh, nobody bothered with me. Not that I had any or any fights with them, but uh, I think my, my personality was such as well. Uh, I minded my business. Uh, I never tried to hurt anybody. I never stole anybody else's bread, and that has happened in prison camp. And uh, I, I was, I, well, maybe I was fortunate. You know, I was never at that point where I was ever approached by uh, the Germans uh, to find out that I was Jewish or not Jewish. I never threw away my dog tags. I was old. We were told, some, some of us were told, uh, if you become a prisoner of war and you're Jewish, you ought to throw away your, your, your prison, your, your, your dog tag. I said, how could I do that? I'll find it. My, my mom, mom will find out I was killed or something, you know. Uh, I never had to do it. I was, uh, whatever it is, I never was confronted that way. Uh, one last thing. Could you explain what each of your uh, medals are, what they represent? That's not the Medal of Honor, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really... Uh, I'll t tell you what's important here. Uh, important is this blue rifle is the uh, combat infantry badge. That means I fought uh, as an infantryman in combat. The purple heart is because I was wounded in action. And the bronze star, uh, which is, was given to my, my, not to me as an individual, but to my, uh, my company because of the stand we took in the Battle of the Bulge to ward off the German attack. The black is the, uh, that's a prisoner of war medal. It's a medal, it's only really something to indicate you were a prisoner of war. I don't know, we want to call it a medal. Uh, most of these are, one is a good conduct medal. So, you know, I can be proud of that. But uh, the one in the middle, basically, is the European theater with a little battle star. It means that I was not only in the European theater as a soldier, but I fought in uh, one of the battles, and that was the Battle of the Bulge. The others are just, uh, they only mean that I was alive. <laughs> the important thing is the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star, and the Combat Infantry Badge. Did the prisoners of war ever try to fight back or escape in the games? Many of us, uh, many of my people uh, made an attempt to escape. Uh, I don't know how many ever did. Uh, I know that I know of no, uh, none of my friends, who, uh, my people that I was involved with, uh, who did make an attempt, ever made it. Uh, many were, the one stories that I hear from the meetings that we've had over the years is that uh, some have tried and, uh, and never were able to get out or whatever. Uh, I don't know of anyone, uh, no, I don't know any story of anyone who went out and was killed, you know, caught, whatever. So, but by and large, many of our people tried to escape. It was not easy. What was keeping you in the camp, like an electric fence or a barbed wire fence? Say that again? Is there, what was the wall around your camp? It was, uh, it was the, the gated fence, and it would have the, uh, what do you call it? Machine gun towers? Or barbed wire. The barbed wire. Yeah. But uh, you couldn't get out that way. Uh, the men who got out of the Elster, and some of us did, went through the hole that I helped dig under, in the back of our, uh, our little barracks. We dug a hole underneath that we could cover up, and if anybody wanted to get out, they knew that they could go there at night you know, get the, uh, move the dirt and be able to slide under the gate. Some, of the, some, some people went, I don't know if they ever made it because we never saw them again.
They may have made it. Why didn't you try it? Why didn't I try it? I told you I wasn't a hero. I was uh, maybe, I went out one night, I told you about the potatoes, and the kitofu. Uh I didn't think I would, able to, I, I would make it, I didn't know where to go. I was, uh, uh, I was very comfortable with the fact that I was, I was going to go home, I was going to get home. I never thought I wasn't going to make it. And uh, I don't have no, I can't really answer that. I had no, uh, no desire, I guess. Uh, <coughs> if I tell you a story that uh, I did get out and I was out for a couple of days, it wasn't, uh, I can't answer. Okay? Murray, one last stupid question. Sure. You ready? What was your first car? My first what? Car. Car? Yeah. Okay, I got uh, my brother and I, a 1949 49, uh, Chevrolet. Okay. Uh, I think it cost $2,000 at that time. And uh, I've had a lot of cars. Yeah. Uh, you name it, I've had them, really. Because these uh, guys are all at the point where they're about to get their first car. I was just wondering. There's some, oh, something oh, about really your too. first car. Well, I, I've had other cars but before then, but the one that I bought yeah. was a uh, 49 Chevy. I got a blue one, my, uh, my brother got a red one. We went to the same place. I think we paid $2,100 for it, mm -hmm. uh, for that car. Uh, I, I, I drive a uh, Lincoln, a new one. I just uh, traded in my, uh, my other Lincoln. I have a Lincoln uh, MKX. Oh, that's nice. The car cost uh, fifty thousand mm -hmm. so dollars. And your first house cost how much? It's two thousand. Your first house. The what? Your first house that you bought. My first house. Um, I bought a house with my brother for my folks in uh, Brooklyn. I think we paid uh, seventy-five hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I bought a house. For uh, I'm not I'm not sure now what that happened. Oh yeah, I bought a house in Brooklyn. I then I bought a, another one. I paid like twenty some odd thousand for a two family. And then I bought the one for forty thousand in Queens, in New York. And today you can't buy a car for that. That's amazing. Well, today, yeah, but my house was worth a lot of more, a lot more than it is today. <laughs> How much was gas? Oh, I, so they, I, I have something. I, I, I didn't bring it with me. Uh, I think it was a eleven cents. And uh, I remember one of the stories we tell because I have a list of how much you earned at that time and what have you. But uh, in gas. Uh, I recall this fellow, Jerry Dworkin, once said, one day we're going to pay 50 cents for a gallon of gas, you'll see. <laughs> of course, if the times were so different. Don't Murray, make... I cannot thank you enough for sharing your story and your time with us. And um, you guys, are we all set? Thank you. Let's shut everything down and... Um, thank you. That's it. Can I get a picture of it? Yes, uh, yes. I, we always...